In Victorian Britain, children were commonly found on the streets, hungry and destitute, sometimes alone or in gangs for safety, victims to poverty, having been sent out to work to support their parents by earning money for food, or sometimes just to fund more alcohol to drink. But they also found their way onto the streets, from broken homes or abusive parents. Indeed, some were orphans. Life was sometimes so bad that an existence as a vagabond on the cold and lonely streets seemed preferable. However, they found their way onto the streets, either by running away from trouble at home or having been sent out to work or beg, they were forced to grow up quickly, become streetwise, and learn to survive in a mean and dangerous world. Some begged a living, others hawked matchboxes and shoelaces or blacked shoes to get by, but some children turned to crime, sometimes called street urchins or gutter snipes by Victorian society. They feared few people, save the police. Today, in an account by a Victorian journalist who investigated contemporary police reports concerning juvenile offenders, you will discover some of the crimes committed by 19th century street children. Many had embarked on a career in petty thievery, prowling alleys and railway arches, fruit markets and the river foreshore for any opportunity to catch food or pickpocket the unwary. You will also hear the strange tale of three boys caught for the bizarre offence of digging up a dead cow. Before you watch, think about what they expected to gain financially from doing this, and leave a comment to let me know if what you thought matched the reality. Find out how some street children, however, went on to commit yet graver crimes, burglary, and even murder. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. One is never morally certain of success with street urchins. It will not do to count chickens till they are grown, as, even after released from their shell prison, the pip may pop them off, or the hawk may hasten their death. So, with young vagabonds, they are very disappointing, for, even where intention is right, habit is strong, and like an uncertain horse, they may stumble at any time, or break rein and dash away. It will never do to trust every boy on first acquaintance. Although your purse is not left to his guardianship, he may possibly make more familiar with your pocket than is agreeable. Nor is it wise to impress them that you have them under sharp surveillance. It will make it worse. If they suspect that your intentions toward them are not honourable, lose a boy once through a false estimate of his character, and you will find it difficult to win him back again. Some boys must be mastered by the force of will. Others, the greater number, are won by love and elevated by kindly counsel. The typical street urchin is sharp and sly. With a seriously sad face, he will detail his grievances while his hand is busy with your watch. They are quick terriers and will smell a policeman at a great distance. At times they grow impudent towards him. I heard of one eight years old, who would skin a bobby with his rasping tongue. Horse-car conductors and omnibus drivers are often goaded into fury by their antics. Shopkeepers are raided upon, and, even when hunger is not prompting, they cannot keep their hands from picking and stealing for the very mischief of doing it. Graver crimes and depredations are frequently committed by juvenile offenders, Reference to the police reports will reveal many a strange tale of childish villainy. One is charged with maliciously causing the death of his brother by drowning him. One, a girl, with being drunk and incapable. Five, with robbing their employers in the capacity of errand boys. Three, with digging up a cow. One, with aggravated assault two with making off with a bather's clothes, and four with orchard robberies. But those charged with graver offences outnumber all the others put together. Little lads, 
many of them no more than nine years of age, are charged with being concerned in various burglaries, housebreakings, and thefts from inhabited houses. As a bare fact, this would be bad enough, but the details of many of the cases reveal a degree of criminal precocity that forcibly brings back to the memory the jail chaplain's warning words. We find mere children of ten or twelve years acting with an amount of daring audacity and cool design altogether irreconcilable with the probability of its being their first offence, or the freak of mere children who cannot be held responsible for their actions. In one instance, two promising babes, each aged nine years, in broad daylight and on the chance of discovering portable plunder, made their way into a private house by means of the washhouse window. The handiest article within reach chanced to be a lady's new cloth jacket, and with this they safely retreated the way they came. But the plunder being secured, which no doubt was of considerable worth, the difficulty arose how to dispose of it. They were too young to offer it at a pawnbroker's, and too shrewd to run the risk of tendering it for sale at a shop in a neighbourhood where they were probably known. So they settled the matter safely, though at a ruinous sacrifice, by tearing the new jacket into shreds and disposing of it for a few pence at a rag shop. Two boys break into a house in the dead of night. The prisoners, on one of whom was found the last instalment of a weekly romance entitled The Black Highwayman, resisted violently when apprehended on the premises by the police, until one of them remarked to the other, "'It's now you, Spill,' We best go quiet. There was conclusive evidence that they had endeavoured to force the door of the wine cellar with a poker and a garden fork, and a large kitchen knife was discovered in the drawing room, where it had been used in opening drawers, and property of high value had been put together ready for removal. About the same date, four boys were concerned in burglariciously breaking into a public house in the same district, the entry being effected by means of the skylight. The actual robbery was entrusted to one of the gang, the other three keeping watch outside. They ran away on the approach of the policeman, who entered the house and found the juvenile robber behind the door with two bottles of spirits in his possession, together with four packets of tobacco and a considerable quantity of money. A few days later, a sixteen-year-old burglar is caught, who had broken into the premises of an oil and colour man, a paint manufacturer and packed up a good parcel of plunder in the kitchen. But, although in the eye of the law the offence is of less magnitude, there is no case among the heavy batch which for vice and depravity equals that of three boys, two of them aged fourteen and the other thirteen, who were indicted for a series of systematic robberies committed on their masters, who were goldsmiths and jewellers. It appeared in evidence that the depredations had been going on for several months, the elder two boys asserting that it was the younger, the one aged thirteen, who had dragged them into crime and egged them on. Indeed, if the testimony coolly tendered by one witness might be relied on, the said youth must be as promising a young rascal as ever stood in a prison dock. The witness in question was a girl, and the revelation she had to make was that the thirteen-year-old boy had lived with her for about five months, and that during that time he had frequently handed to her various articles of jewellery to pledge, and she had done his bidding and handed him the proceeds, and in corroboration of her statement she gave the names of different pawnbrokers who were in attendance, bringing with them the chains, lockets, necklets, bracelets, etc., on which money had been raised. After this appalling instance of juvenile crime, it furnishes but tame reading to be informed that an ingenious little fellow, aged eleven years, was charged with attempting to rob a donation box attached to a public soup kitchen. The novel arrangements, however, the young delinquent had made to effect his aim, are worth mentioning. He had bent a piece of iron and inserted it in the money slit of the box in such a manner that any coin afterwards dropped in would lodge there on. He was taken in the act of operating on the box with two lucifer matches used by way of pincers, and when questioned declared that, 
so far from intending to take anything out, he had observed some money peeping through the slit, and he was endeavouring to push it down. Again, a boy of nine was charged with stealing a jacket, a pair of boots, a pair of stockings, a collar, and a necktie, the whole being the property of another boy who, in consequence of being engaged at the time bathing, was unable to protect his belongings. The bather said the accused ran off with the bundle and handed it to a confederate in the distance, after which he returned to the spot, presumably for the victim's trousers and shirt, and when asked what he had done with the things, he disclaimed all knowledge of them, and threatened to punch the prosecutor if he attempted to follow him. Those who are brought into constant contact with street boys can, by a few questions, detect a thief. A lad, thirteen years of age, once expressed a desire to be put in a way of reformation. From the appearances and behaviour of the applicant, he was supposed to be a thief of some experience, both in the art of pilfering and in the imprisonment which is its result. "'Have you ever been in prison, my lad?' asked the missionary. "'Never in my life, sir,' he immediately replied. "'Hold out your arm,' continued the examiner, Certain that what he heard was a deliberate falsehood, a trained pickpocket, when suddenly called on to stretch forth his hand, will, if he suspect no motive, act quite differently from an untrained person. For instance, our missionary says, if a boy is a pickpocket, on being told to put out his hand, he does so quickly, with his fingers straight, and generally with his first two fingers together. But if he is not a pickpocket, he raises his hand clumsily close to his body, with his fingers bent. Thus the manner of this boy discovered him to be a practical thief. Turn round, my lad, being the next order. The young sinner's movements betrayed his acquaintance with prison drill. This last piece of evidence was perfectly conclusive. You have been in prison, cried the missionary. Upon my honour, I have never seen the inside of a prison in my life, still protested the boy. How can truth be drawn from such strongholds of deceit? This is a question which few can properly answer. Greed and mischief seem sometimes strangely blended in the juvenile mind, as is shown by the fact that, included in the court record, we find four small boys brought up for shying stones at passenger trains on the railway, and two more a week after. One had attained to the ticklish age of nine who had amused themselves by flinging portions of bricks and flint stone onto the roof skylight of a passenger station, some of them breaking through the thick glass and falling on the platform beneath. Other boy delinquents, it appears, combine business with pleasure, as witnessed the incident of the three young fellows, two of them being aged respectively twelve and thirteen, who were charged with a novel though dangerous offence of digging up the body of a cow that had been buried in a field in the vicinity of the cattle market, their object being to cut as much of the fat as they could from the carcass, and realise its worth at the marine store dealers. The animal, as was shown, had been slaughtered in consequence of its being afflicted with a contagious disease, and it was admitted that the carcass was not quite covered with earth, though who was responsible for that serious neglect did not appear. Anyhow, the three boys were taken red-handed, and one of them sentenced to three weeks' hard labour, the other two being remanded for a week. I will quote but one more case, the most grave and unaccountable, considering the age of the accused, a boy of eleven. He was charged with having pushed his brother into the River Thames, and so caused his death, It was done in the presence of a witness, a child, aged nine. The last mentioned heard the elder brother quarrelling with the younger, and saw him thrust the boy off the dock wall into the water, and on the witness threatening to tell, the other, without, as it appears, making the least effort to help his drowning brother, shook his fist in the child's face, saying, "'I'll punch your nose if you say that I chucked him in!' It was not until three days afterwards that the distracted mother, who, meanwhile, had been making inquiries in every direction for her lost little son, obtained a clue to what had happened. Such a deplorable state of affairs furnishes a grim commentary on our boasted intellectual advancement, 
and on the increasing demand for more money to bring as nearly as possible to perfection the present system of education.